Hi there, I'm Eric Wordweaver Shervin, Gothi of the Red Gar Folk, and I'd like to welcome you to the Raven's Call. This is a show where I ramble on about different heathen related subjects, just whatever strikes my fancy, sets my mind on fire at the time. Big UPG warning at the beginning of the episode, like always. Uh, this is just one heathen's take, one Gothi's take here in East Texas. These, I'm not the end all be all of anything. Uh, not some master authority on heathenry, but I've got decades worth of, a couple of decades worth of uh, real life experience and uh, just live in my heathenry. So these are meant to be conversation starters and uh, thought provokers at best to get people thinking and uh, maybe looking outside the box just a little bit. So um, you guys know all the drill, everything's down there. Um, it's playing around, all my social media is down there. I need to add the Instagram on there uh, for the, no, Snapchat, sorry, it's Snapchat. Uh, yeah, I started playing with Snapchat, I'm E. Shervin on Snapchat at E. Shervin, E-S-J-E-R-V-E-N, feel free to to tag me on there if you want to. Uh, it's just another fun thing to play with. So anyway, without any further ado, I guess let's go ahead and jump into today's subject. Now today's subject isn't a viewer request. This is a mind fire that was set off by a conversation that I had with a good friend of mine, Mike. And Mike is just a wonderful plethora of great ideas when it comes to you know deep heathen thought. The guy is really just, he, he's one of those that I love bouncing ideas off of because we both grow every time we talk. And so I've got mad respect for the guy and uh, this was a conversation that we were having on the side and he and I have had it numerous times before. But the idea is a spatial approach versus temporal approach when it comes to heathenry. Now, he, the idea behind a temporal approach or a spatial approach is the focus on the building of community, the focus of building of heathenry. Now, within a temporal approach, we're looking at trying to recreate something that create that existed in a, a time. The focus is on the conceptual, the abstract. The focus is on the research. It's on the learning. It's on the recreating, and it's it is a good place to start. And that's where heathenry has been for the last several decades, is in kind of a temporal approach to heathenry, going through and doing the research, looking at the lore, trying to recreate from these, these, these moments in history and trying to recapture some of that and trying to tap into that kind of temporal awareness. Great place to start because it allows you to rebuild, it allows you to develop um, ideologies, mythologies, it allows you to build the abstract elements of tribe, of your belief structure. However, at some point in time, it has to progress from temporal into spatial in order for things to continue to grow. Now, a spatial approach is a focus on the physical proximity, the physical locality of your existence, not just, you know, where your heathenry exists, but where you exist, your home. It's about building community. It's about building your hearth. It's about building the space in which you live and incorporating heathenry into daily life on a practical and pragmatic level. The way this works out for heathenry is like, for instance, one of the ways that he's going at it is very strongly developing his hearth cult. He's very strongly developing his land, his development of his land, his establishment of his boundaries, really working the land and building a relationship with his his animals, with his his property itself. He's he's clearly defining his boundaries. And when you do this, when you go through and you pour all of this energy into your space, it begins to take on your energies. It becomes, you know, we've talked before about, like in my Husvetir episodes, about expanding the control and power of your Husvetir into your yard by the worked area. The worked area that you cultivate on your property is the stretch that your Husvetir has domain over. And this is a spatial approach. This is a spatial awareness element to the practice of heathenry. It's physically in your proximity, it's in your locality, but it's more than just the physical proximity. It's more than just, you know, um, more than just doing things face to face. You know, it's, it's, it's about real connections. It's about real life. It's, a, it's divesting the artificial connections that we have with individuals like in an online setting and it eschews that in favor of physical connections that you have in your immediate community because as heathens we're not just 
interacting with other heathens. We're interacting with our local communities. We're interacting with our towns, our cities, our jobs. And this spatial approach to heathenry is bringing your heathenry not just from these set times where you can get heathen tribe together, but it's incorporating your heathenry into that spatial awareness. Now, I've done some of this in the past with things like my, you guys met Rumblethump, my office white, uh, when I was working back at my previous job, the, the boys home. And that was me bringing my heathenry into my space. It was a spatially aware, you know, I, I wanted the betterment of that facility. So I worked with the Vatier of the land there and really established a good relationship with them. And it was beneficial for the years that I was there. I saw very real benefit. I also worked in my heathen beliefs into my practices and how I did things, how I interacted with people. I kept in mind my gefrain. I kept in mind um, values and ethics that I held as a heathen and incorporated those in my interactions with other individuals that I was working with, uh, both as client and as other professionals in the field. And it reaped its benefits. Um, I stayed true to who I was. I stayed true to what I was and incorporated that. In today's age, it's very, very easy to branch off and have kind of a, a dual world element of things. You know, you've got your life in the mundane world and then you've got your life in your heathen world where you get together with your tribe, you get together with other heathens, um, you may interact online with other heathens. This is the time that you would do your studies or you would do your practice, you would do your rituals. And a lot of people have begin to kind of delve into that, that spatial approach to heathenry with respect to, you know, daily practices, daily practices, like doing uh, morning rituals, um, doing, you know, taking time to set aside to speak with the ancestors, to connect with the gods. There's a lot of these connections that we can make uh, that help to bring that into the spatial, but it's not all of it. It's not, it's not the entirety of it incorporating your heathenry into the full space working the space is taking the time to get to know your land taking the time to get to know your house taking the time to get to know your surroundings and working with them and learning from them because so much of heathenry was developed on a spatial level uh, the local vetir the, the the gods with the small g were the ones that they would interact with like the the spirit of the river or the fields or the hills, the mountains, and they would work with these spirits in order to maintain a good positive relationship and for the betterment of their people. They got to know their fields. They knew what the fields needed, when the fields needed what. They knew how to tend to their animals and what worked, what didn't work. And that became very much incorporated into their heathenry because a spatial awareness, a spatial approach to heathenry is not just bringing your heathenry into the space around you. It's bringing the space around you into your heathenry. Um, a temporal approach to heathenry creates almost a crystalline form of heathenry. And this is something that I have um, had an issue with, with certain approaches to heathenry. Uh, the need to recreate based on a specific time, a specific snapshot in history. This is a temporal approach. And what it does is it creates a, a crystalline form. It creates a hard set still image of heathenry and is not a living, breathing thing. Heathenry is a living, breathing approach to life. It is not, I use the term worldview, which a lot of people have the issue with worldview because of new agey issues and whatnot. Um, it's the same thing as having an issue with the word spirituality, which is very much an aspect of heathenry. I very much em embrace the term worldview because it is a worldview. It's how you view the world. It's how you interact with a reality around you. And it is a different approach than some of the more modern uh, westernized cultures that we deal with. And so because of that, because of that difference, I have to look at and incorporate different things and try to try to reconcile them within my view of heathenry and how I approach things. It's a necessary thing because we have to be able to evolve, we have to be able to grow, we have to be able to develop. And if we don't, then we run the risk of hitting that crystalline form. It's a stasis. It is a stagnation after effect. Um, if you look to the runes, one of the runes that will speak to this heavily is Isa. Isa is the rune of ice and it is stillness. It is 
and entropy. Now there's a couple of ways that you can look at Issa. There's the stillness of mind and calmness like a hunter that draws that breath and that moment of stillness before the shot. There's that moment of self-awareness that a person can reach uh, in order to delve into introspection, uh, to gain wisdom, that step back and calm moment. Uh, there is a strong use for stillness. But Issa can also be a very damaging situation because it can speak of stagnation. It can, it can speak of entropy. It can speak of an unwillingness to move when movement might be necessary. This is different from the Hagalaz room, which is forceful and damaging and destructing. It's still an ice room, but it is, it is forceful destruction. Issa is that hesitation in its negative form. It is that, that stillness whether or not it's good or bad. And sometimes that stillness can be very damaging. And this is one of the things that I worry about with, with heathenry when people focus too much on a temporal approach. Um, while a great place to start and a good stepping stone to step off of, you eventually have to move out of that stillness into something that is real, that is living, that is breathing. And this is where a spatial approach can really help and benefit. In order to create older lands, Otala, something that is passed down, that immaterial wealth that is real. Like, um, like it, one of the great ways to look at this is if you look at ranchers. Ranchers get spatial approach to everything because the ranch is a living, breathing part of their lives. They work the land, they know the land, they love the land, and the land is part of the family. It's not just a place they live, it's not just a thing they do, it is a member of the family. Now this is something that's easy to look at from that aspect because they still get to do that. In modern day, it's very difficult to establish that kind of spatial presence, that multi-generational spatial presence that will allow for building of older lands, of building um, that, that making that land a member of the family, making it part of the inner. Because what you do when you establish that, when you work the land, you extend your energies into it, you make it a thing. And I've talked before about naming, being a thing, bringing something into reality, recognizing the spirit within and bringing, recognizing the life within it. Um, it's common in uh, naming of weapons, naming of ritual items, things like that. It's br that recognition of the spirit within and bringing it forward and embracing it, acknowledging it, and then working with it as a living thing. This is what we're talking about from a spatial approach as well. When you're dealing with your space, your surroundings, whatever that may be, and really incorporating it, really embracing the fact that where you live is as much a part of you as you know, what you believe and what you think. Um, taking it out of the mindscape and putting it into the physical world around you. Establishing it and manifesting it in that physical space through whatever means it is that you do. Um, through working the land, through uh, decorations within your home, establishing, you know, a lot of people will go through and, and you know, decorate their homes with, uh, with heathen imagery and whatnot. A great way to bring that out there, but if it's just aesthetic trappings, that may not necessarily be uh, working towards the cause, as it were. Uh, you know, having a decoration on the wall may be great for an aesthetic purpose, may be great for establishing your sense of self within the space, working towards the goal, uh, but may not necessarily be as beneficial as, you know, when you come in and they see herbs hanging by the door um, and you being able to say, you know, that's for this blessing or that's for that blessing. They see a, a runic work that you have hanging on a wall facing the door or on the front porch or something and you're able to describe the warding that goes into it and what it's for. Uh, being able to look at your space and being able to define it in terms of your heathenry and then also taking that space and working it into your heathenry. Recognizing what's there. You can't just impose your mindscape on the physical world around you. You need to allow the physical world around you to influence your mindscape when you're dealing with establishing a spatial approach. It's a give and take. Just like reciprocal obligation within our social contracts, we have a reciprocal relationship with our spatial surroundings, with our community. Now, community is a thing that gets eschewed because people want to stick with like. There's a homogeneic element to uh, social grouping where like seeks like. 
and that's that's not bad I mean we that's how we survive we seek out our tribe we seek out our similar but in order to survive we have to exist within the communities that we exist in and having a presence within that community being there being part of it is a thing um, again Western society is not great about this because we live in communities where you may live in town where you've got 20 or 30 different neighbors and you may not know any of them you may be in an, in a village but be an island unto yourself you may never interact with your community around you but if everything were to go left if everything were to fall apart as far as the infrastructure that we have in place if all the artificial things set into place disappear it is community that will pull through small town rural towns get it because they understand that they need to band together when things get real look at small towns after a tornado after an earthquake after a fire and look at neighbor helping neighbor it doesn't matter what your race your creed whatever they're helping each other because that's what people do and as heathens we do the same thing so it doesn't matter if your neighbor is a Christian or if they're Jewish or if they're um, whatever pick, pick a religion doesn't matter because that's not the point the point is that you're part of a community you're part of a surrounding area and it's your space it is the space that you exist in and so it helps to understand that you are not an island and in order to live a full and complete life you need to be aware of the community that you're in and find your place therein now not all communities are going to be open and welcoming to heathenry we all know this um, especially if you live in certain areas uh, we often say that you know Tyler is kind of the buckle of the Bible belt in this section because uh, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of reason for that there's a lot of uh, there's some connecting ley lines there's some strong spiritual energy workings from a natural point that lead to Tyler being an epicenter for spiritual work which means there's a large reason why there's a church on every corner uh, but there's also a very large population of pagans and non-christians in the area uh, because there's a very strong spiritual energy in this area that just kind of leads to that understanding that and having a spatial awareness means tapping into those energies and understanding where I am what I'm working with and how that influences the rituals that I do my daily life how I go about things recognizing that and working with what works with the land because I've talked about this before when it comes to the holidays you know there's a temporal approach to the holidays where you go through and you look and you see when the arch heathens practiced their holidays there's a, you, know, you can go in and you can recreate midsummer you can go in and you can recreate Yule um, you can do the three-day Yule you can do you know the approach of the uh, the solstice approach to uh, Yule you can do all of that which is fine from a temporal standpoint it's a good building block but what worked for arch heathens in northern Europe and in mainland Europe did not work for my tribe here in East Texas because they didn't line up um, because you get down to the why why did they do this why did this holiday occur at this time of year why did they approach it in this fashion and when you start to look to the why's and you apply that to the world around you and you incorporate the world around you with that you create an amalgamation that becomes your tribal culture your tribal approach to it and that's valid that's that's what you want that's when I, I talk about hashtag grassroots heathenry all the time I'm big on grassroots I'm not big on like uh, national orgs I'm not big on online heathenry I'm big on face-to-face -face practices you know I don't do online rituals don't do them at all uh, I only do my rituals in person in the bay and in, if I have to save some of the blessing water in order to impart that blessing on some of my tribe that wasn't able to attend that's how I do that because you cannot forge a real connection over the internet you cannot do a ritual over the internet and it be truly effective people will try to argue me argue with me about this I have tried things in multiple different aspects sorry guys I've got real-world experience that says you cannot do this effectively uh, at least not what I'm looking for and not the connections that I'm looking for and not the energy work that I'm looking for there is a proximity that is necessary for these things to really work yeah you can go through the motions but the actual energy work and the exchange of energies um, it's a proximity thing 
a lot of times what people do and feel works is when they're doing separate rituals that they sync up utilizing technology in order to have that artificial sense of community. In all reality, you're doing your ritual, they're doing their ritual, and ne'er the twain shall meet as far as the energies go. Yeah. Um, the, the internet changes a lot of things, but the kind of blessings and the kind of energy exchanges that we're talking about need a proximity. There, there's a physicality to it that is absolutely necessary. It's the physical doing of something. Going from dogma into praxis requires physicality, it requires proximity. And that spatial approach to things brings things from mindscape into the physical locale. So that's, that's a bit rambly, but I think you guys get where I'm going at. At least I hope you do. If not, ask questions. You know where. Uh, the spatial approach, when you start establishing the spatial approach in your home, in your area, in your hearth area, be that a yard, be that acreage, whatever it is you've got, you begin to create sacred space out of your hearth. You know, you are extending the reach of your hearth god, your kof god, your husvetir. And in extending their reach and their sovereignty into this space, you create sacred space to that husvetir, to that kof god, to that god with a small g. Because that's what they, they are. They are personal gods. They are household gods. We're not the only culture that established household gods in the approach to that. You see reference to it in Roman and Greek stuff as well. You see reference to it in a number of other polytheistic religions. The idea that there is a spiritual presence that looks over and protects that space, that home. It's the same as establishing you know, the god of the mountain, the god of the river, the god of the lake, the god of the fields, these, you know, the god of the forest, these, these Vaitir that are what I would refer to as alpha level Vaitir that oversee an area. They are gods with a small g. And when you get those small g gods, that space that is theirs becomes sacred to them. Now this is different in and then dealing with you know sacred space, sacred time when it comes to the gods. Uh, that when we're dealing with the divine, that's a different division. And so we establish that in the Ve through establishing boundaries, a purpose for the space, dedicated use of the space, or repetitive use of the space, and flooding it with those energies. That's why the sacred space to the gods that we call our Ve, or some would call a Hof, depending on what you're dealing with, inside, outside, all that stuff. These become sacred spaces because of the sacred energies that are established therein, that flood that space. You know, I use the imagery of the well. We establish the ring of the well and then we flood it with sacred energies. That's what creates that sacred space. When you're dealing with your husvetir, your kof god, when you're dealing with your house god, you are establishing the boundary of your space and then you are flooding it with their energies. It becomes a large well. This is where you draw the energy from the, the husvetir. And this is where your god with a small g benefits you and your family. You begin this reciprocal relationship with your husvetir, with your kof god. And in so doing, you reap the benefits of the luck that they give you. You, you reap the benefits of the blessings that they give unto the land, they grow stronger as their influence grows stronger, and therefore they become more powerful. They can be very powerful in a small space. It's not necessarily the amount of space they take up. It's the amount of energy you allow to flood that space that you bring out into it. You become their vessel to bring their influence and their power into that space. Your work, your energy is done in their name help to seed the energies in that area, and you claim that space. You give them sovereignty over that space, and you work with them on that. And it becomes sacred space to the god with a small g. This is a spatial approach to things. This is how you bring, this is how you make your home your sacred space. That is, that also, when you think about it in that respect, when you think about it as your sacred space, it becomes all the more important that you protect that space and you protect that sacred spatiality. When you start thinking about the, the sacredness of the locale, the sacredness of your surrounding space, 
you then start to weigh who you let into it. You then start to weigh the, the chores that you may take for granted because they become obligations to the small g. Uh, you, you look at, you know, well, I don't want to go out and mow the land, tend the land, and you see the creeper vines start coming back in, the thorns and the brush, the tree line tries to push back in, and they begin to lose their influence on that space. They begin to lose their power. In order to show your respect to them, you go out and you tend it, and you keep it, and you protect it. If, it, if you're working with a suburban area where you have a yard, then you are working within the yard. And you learn what the vetir of the area like. You know, if you've got hummingbirds in your area, you may utilize feeders or flowers that they prefer in order to give those things a, spa a safe space within your sacred space that allows them as guests, that invited guests, because you're showing them respect. You're showing them that you pay attention and you are inviting them in by offering up something that you know that they would enjoy. That's, that's how you start to work the space. It's not just about the sacrifices that you make, it's about how you develop and how you tend to the space. Like at our place, one of the things that we do, we're big on the local wildlife, especially my lady. She is huge on the local wildlife. I don't think I've ever met anybody that is this in tune with the Vaytir. Um, that's, that's just her jam and that's where her comfort space is and she really it really embraces it sometimes to our detriment <laughs> because if a stray comes up on the property it's now her baby um, it can go home that's fine but as long as it's there it's her guest and she's going to treat it appropriately and that can get cumbersome sometimes especially when you know the neighbors puppies come up and there's a dozen of them and you have to take care of them um, feed them and then hopefully they will go home uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, because of this relationship that she has with the local Vetir, uh, she will have a connection to that land and that spatial awareness, that spatiality that incorporates a piece of her into it. It's a manifestation of her and her approach and her values, the way that she sees life. It can get expensive, so you have to decide how and what is appropriate uh, and, and don't over encumber yourself because if you look at the Havamal, one of the things that it warns against is over gifting. Um, over gifting creates a burden upon yourself and therefore devalues the gift in the eyes of the other individual. A freely given gift needs to be appropriate, but it also needs not put undue stress, excessive sacrifice on your hearth. Otherwise, what you are giving them is not the bounty of your work, your energy, of your, you know, the, reaping the benefits of your weird and your actions, what you are giving them is the hardship that you are then taking on as a result of over-gifting, and it taints that gift. So, gifting 201. <laughs> Thinking about over-gifting is a thing. Same thing when you're working with the property and the land. If you overstretch, then you're not going to be able to uphold your end of the bargain. So, understanding the breadth of your boundaries and what you can do within that space and maintain is important. It's a factor to keep in mind. So it's working with the Vatir. It's working with your surrounding community. It's creating a physical manifestation of your heathenry in the space around you and creating your sacred space. If you are... It's kind of like being a Sunday heathen versus being an everyday heathen, you know? Uh, yes, I know I'm cribbing that from the Christian side of things, but it's an important thing to understand. Um, a sometimes heathen that is only practicing heathenry when they do their rituals, only practicing heathenry when they have gatherings, when they have festival, when they have uh, uh, meetups or things like that, uh, you're, you're living a partial heathen life, but you're not necessarily fully embracing it. Now, you do you. You know, it's not my hall, not my call, but if you want to see multi-generational establishment and perpetuation of your tribal culture, then your tribal culture needs a seed. It needs to be established. Like, the, we do all of our rituals at the Godi's home. That's just how we do things. We come to my home, we do it in my vey, and that's where we do tribal rituals. Each of my, each of my members has their own hearth cult. They have their own hearth cultures. They establish their presence in their spatiality. And when I go to their space, I respect 
what it is they have established there. I don't try to superimpose tribal culture over their hearth culture. That's not how that works. I respect the culture into which I step, and I recognize that their hearth culture is going to be different than my hearth culture, and different yet again from the tribal culture that we have established. I do not superimpose all of my, tri my hearth practices on our tribe practices. It's not, the, the two don't meet. Um, we have tribe practices that we do as a group, and then I have practices that I do in my space, in my home, that establish the sacredness of my location, that establish my relationship with my land, with my husvetir, and it's, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. The drinking game again. Um, a spatial approach allows for a, an everyday heathen. It allows for a fully embraced heathen life because you are not just bringing your heathenry into your spatial surroundings, you are incorporating your space into your heathenry. How does your heathenry interact with the community around you? How does your tribe interact with the community around you? How does your hearth interact with the community around you? What is your space there? What is your presence in that space? Do you have connections with your local community? And if not, why? Um, is it something that is for the betterment of your hearth that you hold back because there are negative elements there? And in that case, how do you guard your hearth from those negative elements around? Because, let's face it, some people are surrounded by situations that are not favorable, not safe, not good for their hearth. So then your spatial awareness in this respect, your spatial approach becomes warding your space protecting your space from those negative influences from the outside so that this space is indeed safe. It is indeed your inner yard. When you recognize your space as an entity and embrace it as a living, breathing thing, your husvetir is a manifestation of that space. Your husvetir is the embodiment of that space. It is the spirit of that space. And when you recognize them as an entity and a member of that community, they become part of your inner, your innengath, your inner yard. And therefore the yard becomes the inner yard. It becomes inner. And that's an important distinction to make because you then have reciprocal obligations with your space and how you work that. It's, there's a lot of depth to understanding a spatial approach versus a temporal approach. This is light skimming across the top with some deeper elements tagged on there. But this is a conversation that could be had for hours and hours and hours over a fire and you know a nice mead and uh, maybe a pipe and uh, a wonderful time to sit and communicate and discuss. But ultimately speaking, your spatial approach is entirely based on your locale. When you look at some of the tribal differences that occurred across heathenry throughout archheathen times, because archheathen times is not one specific time, it is a huge section of history um, prior to the conversion, uh, when heathenry didn't even have a name, it was just what they believed and what they did. The tribal differences that you saw were largely manifestations of a spatial approach to their worldview, because they were incorporating things regarding their community, their space, the land around them, the way they interact with it, the spirits that they interact with, what's important to them culturally. And it's, it's not just where you live, it is what you live, it's how you live. It is everything about the physical space around you. It's how you go about interacting with other people. It's how you interact with your community. And we play at this online. We play at this online. Um, online is simply a reflection of the mask that you put up on there. Um, it's not a full connection. It's not a real connection. You can still have very good friends that you've met online, etc., etc., but you're only ever seeing the face that they put forward online, which is a limited view of their reality. Um, I, I have known a number of people that I had interactions with that I would have considered friends from online that when I met in person, I realized, oh, we don't jive nearly as much as I thought we did. Um, our online presence is fine, 
uh, but that's a mask that we put on to interact online because that's the role that we play. It's different when you are in your element, when you are in that space where you don't have to put on a mask, in that space where you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, keeping business this and keeping this that, or you know, worrying about you know what somebody is going to think of you on this. When you are in your space, in your locale, your safe space, as it were, um, you are you, and that's different when you're dealing with people online versus in real world. When you get to meet somebody in real life and you get some face-to-face -face interaction, you actually exchange energies. You begin to get a feel for the elements that don't translate when they're just putting their best face forward online, when they're just putting their, uh, their veneer up. Uh, it, it's, it's a thing. Heathenry, requ heathenry requires a physicality and a proximity, but to really embrace and really live a truly full, hashtag happy, whole, healthy, heathen life, um, you need a full spatial approach to heathenry. You need your entire surrounding to be your heathenry. Not just what's up here, but what's around here too. And you figure out what your boundaries are. You know, do you have a yard? Do you have land? Do you have an apartment? And therefore the boundaries of your reach are simply the walls around you. Okay, establish that boundary and work within it. Are you in a duplex where you share a wall with somebody? Well, everything on your wall over is yours and you establish that boundary. You establish that relationship and you begin to know the relationship with your Vetir, and then you also understand the relationship with others because you, the spirits around create a community the same way that we create a community. So knowing how you interact with your Husvetir, you also need to understand the surrounding Vetir and how your Husvetir interacts with them. Are they hostile? Are they open? What's the relationship like? And then you, as a as an agent of your Husvetir, of your Kolf God, uh, then have to work the surrounding area in a way that is in accordance with that relationship. You know, if, uh, if they're hostile with the surrounding area, you're going to have to be more aggressive with your approach. If it's more of a laissez-faire kind of relationship, well then, you know, you get a little bit more ebb and flow with it, especially when you're like in a rural setting. It's kind of a... I find a lot of times in rural type settings, there's kind of a soft boundary give and take to it uh, versus more of an urban setting where things are very rigid. Uh, there's some very hard boundaries that occur there. So you have to be pretty aggressive with the control of it. But uh, a lot of times with a, an urban setting, you have established boundaries that are hard set boundaries and therefore you don't necessarily have to control that. Like if you have an apartment, you're not going to have to do a whole lot of boundary fighting uh, to maintain your spatial presence versus say a rural setting where you really got to work at maintaining those boundaries as far as, you know, spheres of influence. Um, you have the land that you work, sort of, you know, like your hay fields and stuff like that, that are worked land, but not as heavily worked as, say, your yard. Um, so there's strong sphere of influence and then decreasing influence as you go out in outer spheres. So um, spheres of influence are a thing uh, when dealing with spatial and proximity elements. And this goes as well for your community because your hearth is going to have different spheres of influence within your community. And that gets a little more Venn diagrammy uh, because there's overlay and you are respecting the boundaries and approach of other hearths, whether they call themselves hearths or not. What you recognize as a family unit, as a hearth, as a stead, uh, you are interacting with other steads. They may not call themselves that, but that's what they are. And that's, that's the thing about a worldview. Other people may not call themselves that, but you understand it within your culture, within your view, your view of the world. And so I have individuals that are definitely not heathen, don't have a heathen approach to things, but I still treat them as a hearthstead. I still respect them and interact with them the way that I would any heathen. The exact aesthetics of that, the exact praxis of that may vary as I respect their boundaries and their culture, but that's how I would with any tribe because no two tribes operate the same way. If I'm interacting with another tribe in the Midwest that I happen to know and, and have a good relationship with, I'm going to respect their hearth culture, their tribal culture when I go to their space and they will respect mine when they come here. We do the same thing with our neighbors and with our surrounding community. You respect their hearthsteads and their approaches and as you show that respect, they will show respect to you 
hopefully. You have no control over that, but you know, the best you can do is, is put your best foot forward and hope, and if they step on it and it's negative, then you start to build those walls and boundaries as is appropriate to protect that hearth and that culture, uh, that, that sacred space that you have established. And by establishing that sacred space, you give a safe place for your hearthstead individuals, your Inengarth, to come back to. Because of the way we establish our spatial presence on our property, at our stead, the different hearths of my tribe are welcome there. And they know this, and it is a safe place for them. When we gather on my property, it's like a space outside of the rest of the space. It is its own little world. And when you treat it like its own little world, butting up against other worlds, then you start to get more of that spatial awareness uh, with regards to you know your influence and your spheres of influence. So anyway, um, this is a long drawn out conversation, but it's something that I think people would benefit from exploring and from understanding, having conversations on. I've really got to thank Mike for you know getting me ginned up about this subject again. He and I have had several conversations about it in the past, but we had one recently uh, over my group chat that just got my mind turning again. I'm like, you know, it's video time. Let's, let's do a little bit about this. Get people thinking about it and approaching it differently. And uh, the understanding is that when you have a spatial approach and you establish a physicality of, of space, of an understanding of you know community interaction as well as establishing the sacredness of your own space, you establish your tie to the land and you establish that it is a member of the family, just like that ranch that I referred to before. A ranch that gets passed down from family member to family member, it's not about who owns the ranch at that time. Um, you know, grand, great, great, great grandfather may have established the ranch, but grandson, when he inherits it, is not you know, suddenly, you know, king of the land kind of thing. He's not the owner of the ranch. He's responsible for the ranch at this point. He is the steward of the ranch. Now, steward is an important role to think of because when you are a steward of something, you are not the liege lord of this thing. You are a protector of it, a tender of it. You are responsible for it. And if it's going to continue on into future generations, you need to do your part and uphold your end of the bargain so that it can be passed on. Now, in the Western society, we're not really looking heavily at passing land on. Uh, there is an impermanence that is unfortunately intrinsic with Western society that makes it difficult to establish things like odal lands. But still, through establishing spatial proximity, a spatial awareness, a spatial approach, elements of that can be passed on to future generations. Um, elements that are, you know, this comes from that place. You know, heirlooms, we talked about heirlooms before. Heirlooms become important. And something that would otherwise have been an innocuous item because it comes from that stead, because it comes from that place of sacredness, it becomes a relic and it is a thing of honor within your tribal culture. And so it then can be treated with the respect that it is due and passed on. And that builds that Othala tie. Um, that, that, that Othala is the rune for understanding spatial, uh, a spatial approach, is developing that Othala. Those of you that study the runes will understand what I mean by that. It's when you To establish Othala, you need a spatial approach. Uh, you cannot develop Othala without a spatial approach. Not, not really, not truly. Um, yeah, I mean, even if you're not talking about the land, if you're just talking about the things, the, the immaterial things that will last, the things that are of greater value than their monetary value, that will last and be passed on takes that spatial awareness. If you've only got a temporal approach, then you're not going to be creating those things. It's not a living, breathing thing. Um, more of a spatial approach and embracing the world around you gets that development going and new things grow, new things develop, new things take on meaning and purpose. So I'm going to ramble on forever. I'm going to go ahead and tie up here, but I hope this gives you guys something to think about. Um, this is a subject I could ramble on for ages 
and uh, I don't want to, this is going to take long enough to upload as it is. So we may revisit this in the future because it is something that I think is very important and we may get into some of the more granular elements of spatial versus temporal, but as I incorporate those things, I needed you guys to have a basis of understanding with what I mean when I'm talking about temporal versus spatial approach to heathenry and how that impacts heathenry and our growth forward. In order to have heathenry develop into a lasting culture that's going to exist beyond our present generation, a spatial approach is necessary. It, it genuinely is. Um, to bring it into the world, to manifest it into the space around us, to make it real. Not just in our heads, but make it real. To bring what's in here, out here, uh, is... And, and that takes work. That takes a, a mindfulness. It takes action. And action is better than inaction. We are our deeds. Uh, these are the things that we do. So, um, another example of spatial impact is like, even though it's not on my property, even though it's not something that is mine to pass down kind of thing, um, my grandfather was a, an integral part in the establishment of Loop 49 here in the Tyler area. Uh, that was his baby. He was he was a driving force. Now, it did not pan out the way that he wanted it to. Um, it was never meant to be a toll road in perpetuity. It was only supposed to pay for itself and then become a free uh, loop. But after he died, a lot of that stuff changed. So that's unfortunate. But still, I get to look at that and know that a piece of my family's legacy is established within the land around us. There are ways to leave those legacies and that is where that kind of spatial embracing comes in as well, uh, spatial approach. So there's a number of different ways to go at it. Somebody keeps, I've seen comments before about, well, let's go ahead and wrap up. And then he talks for another 20 minutes. Yeah, that, that's me. Um, in Texas, we have a phenomenon called doorknobbing. Uh, that's where you say goodbye and then you get up to walk out. And 20 minutes later, you're still standing there with the doorknob in your hand. Uh, because even though you've stood up to say goodbye, you spend a half hour saying goodbye and other things pop up and you keep talking and so you're doorknobbing. You're standing there with the doorknob in your hand, still talking, even though you've begun to make your exit. So there you go. Uh, that's, that's, that's a thing. <laughs> so I'm doorknobbing. Anyway, thank you all. I appreciate your continued support of the channel. Uh, I'm going to continue to try and pump these things out as best I can on something of a regular schedule. Uh, right now, we're still kind of ticking along with the every other week thing. Uh, it's hurting my views, but I don't do this for the numbers. So it's for the information and for the community. So hopefully you guys continue to enjoy this. And as long as you're all right with the more erratic schedule, or at least the more drawn out schedule, I'm going to continue that for a little bit because I just don't have the energy and the time to be able to put together a weekly show. So stay tuned. Um, there may be some changes in things coming forward. And if there is... Uh, from like my job approach and things like that. I may end up with some more free time that I can go back to a more weekly schedule. I don't know. We'll see. I'm not making any promises, but there may be changes. You know how it is. It's life. We live it. We do it. It's what we do. So hail to you all. Thank you. And may your hearth fires burn bright. All right, let's give this a shot. Fun and games. <laughs> Life is trucking along, still trying to work on another D&D session. We'll have one here soon, I hope. Uh, not much otherwise as far as details go or updates go. It's been a lot of uh, just work and the home. So mm, you guys know how it goes. I am dog tired working these two jobs and getting like zero sleep is wearing me down, but trekking through. Ordeal breeds worth, remember? So life is uh life is life going along really well so hopefully in the near future i'll have some more fun stuff to put in the post credits but for now we're gonna just kind of leave it at that and skip ahead thank you guys for continuing to follow and uh, hopefully it'll, i'll have some more fun stuff for the uh, cutting room floor <laughs> without any further ado let's go ahead and jump in we're live in three two one let's jam <laughs> 